So welcome to Live 2021 Nephrology Campus. My name is uh, Peter Stenwinkel. I work at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. And I chair these events together with my uh, co-organizer Christoph Wanner at the University Hospital in Würzburg in Germany. So we present to you 18 webinars about current trends in nephrology. Before we start this 14th webinar, there are some housekeeping rules. You should remember that you as an attendee, you are automatically muted and invisible, but you should feel free to ask questions via the question field in GoToWebinar at any time. So now it's an honor for me to introduce you to the speakers of the 14th webinar. It's an honor for me to introduce Professor Bernard Canot from France, Professor Simon Davis from United Kingdom, Professor Andrew Davenport also from United Kingdom, and today we will talk about sodium management in end-stage kidney disease and dialysis. So at first it's an honor for me to introduce Professor Bernard Canot and he will talk about sodium as a uremic toxin, new insights, in an old problem. Professor Cano, please. Thank you, dear colleagues, dear chairman. I'm pleased to introduce the topic about a new insight in a very old problem, which is a sodium and particularly sodium as a uremic toxin. So the outline of my presentation is based on five sub chapters. I will talk about cardiovascular burden, sodium pathophysiology, what we learn, osmotic sodium, tissue sodium, and some take-home message. So, as we know, cardiovascular burden is a tremendous uh, risk for dialysis patient. And just as an example, taking this uh, USRDS data, it's shown that almost two-thirds of dialysis patients will die from cardiovascular disease, particularly for arrhythmia or sudden cardiac death, but also from stroke or vascular disease, but also congestive heart failure. So really cardiovascular disease is a tremendous impact on the mortality of diseased patient. So also it's interesting to see that search and particularly research in diseases is focused on identifying or looking on the toxicity of organic compound, particularly middle and large molecular substances. I don't want to go into detail, but also protein bound uremic toxin. So meaning that research is focusing on a very complex identification of organic compound. Why we know that most of inorganic compound and particularly sodium and water, but also phosphate are still neglected and certainly represent the most important killer of our end stage kidney disease and diseases patient. Sodium pathophysiology has changed completely over the last 15 years, and I will show you some new findings. As we know, sodium accumulation is a continuous process across chronic kidney disease progression, starting with LT and having, I would say, the ultimate stage at the end stage kidney disease, meaning that fluid accumulation, sodium accumulation are responsible for poor outcome particularly through hemodynamic action, but also some metabolic one and inflammatory one. So that's a task of diesis or any form of renal replacement therapy, try to re restore this sodium homeostasis. Just on this slide, I put the cardiovascular burden linked to water and sodium disorder. Heart failure, left ventricular hypertrophy, hyponatremia, hypertension, fluid overload. So many of these five factors are reflecting some point salt and water disorder, meaning that at the end, you have to make a very strong effort to correct this abnormality. This is part of my presentation, certainly one of the most important one, is what we learn in terms of new pathophysiology of sodium. So on the left side, as you know, this is uh, the old concept, which is associating osmotic sodium to some hemodynamic action, particularly through hypertension and mechanical one, 
meaning that the mechanical toxicity is providing all organ damage and certainly contributing to the poor outcome. But what we learned more recently, that's sodium store in the tissue, what we call water-free sodium, is also very active, certainly to contribute to organ damage and poor outcome via some metabolic toxicity. So the first aspect is the osmotic sodium, the classical one. As we know, sodium osmotically active act through the hemodynamic action and particularly via the hypertension to create cardiovascular disease on this uh, patient. But also what we learned more recently, it's the action that we have to correct this fluid overload and particularly diasis prescription could be part of this diasis induced systemic stress, creating, I would say, further damage to the patient. So at the end, accumulation of the sodium, mechanical toxicity, but management could contribute to the mortality of this patient. Just a few examples. I selected four, fluid overload, hypertension, heart failure, and hyponatremia as a contributing factors for the cardiovascular outcome. This is coming from the retrospective study in a large database using bioimpedance measurement to assess fluid overload of the patient, just to show that two thirds of the diabetes patient, hemodiasis patient in that case, but that certainly would be the same in PD, present some degree of fluid overload. Interestingly, 25%, one quarter, present with very severe or extremely severe fluid overload, meaning that even in a well-treated patient, we have a lot of issue with this fluid overload. What we learn from this is the same study. If you split the patient in quintiles, as you see from this slide, from, I would say, almost normal volemic patient to hypervolemic patient, up to five liters fluid overload, you see that the mortality in less than one year is increased by 20%. And of course, if you are not able to correct after the diabetes patient, the risk is maintained over this uh, one year follower. Not only we learn that fluid overload is uh, associated with mortality, but if you look on these four uh, sectors graph, putting, I would say, fluid overload and systolic graph pressure, as you see, fluid overload is associated with hypertension, uh, increasing relative risk of death and even twice as compared to the normal population. But interestingly, fluid overload per se without any hypertension is also associated with a high risk of mortality, meaning that sodium per se, independently from the pressure level, is a risk factor for the, for the cardiovascular mortality. In this study, in, the, in this incident population, meaning less than six months starting the diagnosis, at the baseline, Fluid overload is associated with a 40 to 50% increase of mortality independently from the level of pressure. But one year later, if the population is not corrected for such fluid overload, you see that the risk of mortality is increased by almost 50%. Meaning again, that fluid overload is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular mortality. Not only mortality, but also fluid overload and this is coming from the US RDS, it's uh, the first cause of hospitalization in, in US. Almost 23, 25% admission in hospitalization are linked to pulmonary edema, reflecting some fluid overload. So it's a part of the morbidity and certainly a tremendous impact on the quality of life of the patient. Now, as I said, ultrafiltration as a part of managing the fluid overload is also a risk factor. And from this fly study, we learned that UFR, ultrafiltration rate expressed in milliliter per hour per kilo, if you reach more than 13 ml per hour per kilo, you increase mortality risk by 60%. That's easy. It's almost 750 milliliters for a 70 kilo patient. Also, what we learned is, of course, high ultrafiltration rate is associated with hypovolemic condition and then increasing the incident of intradilytic hypotension. Frequency of intradilytic hypotension and intensity, in that case, less than 90 millimeter of mercury 
increased mortality by 50 or 40% in these uh, two large cohort studies. This point, hyponatremia, as I mentioned, is not infrequent. And this is coming from the EMR study. And if you look, this population divided in quartiles, as you see, one quarter of the population get hyponatremic less than 136 millimole per liter, meaning that it's impressive to see that one quarter get hyponatremic. But this hyponatremia is associated with all cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality. And higher or lower is the hyponatremic condition and higher is the relative risk of mortality, meaning that hyponatremia is reflecting some illness in the patient. It's not just from the US. In the Japanese study, which is very recently published, and as you know, the Japanese population is a very low risk in terms of that in the indices. Again, they identify that in a large cohort of patients, almost 20% of the population present with hyponatremic condition, 136, associated with higher risk of mortality up to 20% after two years. But not only, if you look on the cause of mortality in this population, impressively, they are associated with a cerebral infarction, lower limb amputation, meaning decompensation of peripheral arteriopathy, meaning that at the end, hyponatremia is certainly part of this cardiovascular risk. But not, not only, what they show in this interesting study, if, if you now try to correct this hyponatremia and increasing the diazide plasma gradient, so meaning trying to correct this hyponatremia by the diazide sodium concentration, you increase tremendously the risk of cerebral infarction and lower limb amputation. So correcting just by acting on that diazide sodium could be a risky process. The fourth topic is of course, tissue, tissue sodium. And uh, as I put in this slide, this is reflecting the content of tissue sodium acting more on the metabolic side and certainly metabolic toxicity, but again, contributing to poor outcome in this uh, population. How to manage this patient and how to make sure we can correct this tissue sodium, that's a different story. I selected the three studies. The first one, this is a study in, in not in stage advanced kidney disease patient, almost 100 patient. But what was performed in this study is to correlate the left ventricular mass measured by M MRI and skin sodium content measured by sodium MRI. And as shown on this slide, there is a nice linear relationship between sodium content accumulation and left ventricular mass. And that, interestingly, is not linked to the pressure. As shown on the same study, almost most of the patients get hypertensive, but they are controlled. And if you look on the blood pressure, either from office or 24 ambulatory pressure, there is not a lot of change. But what makes the difference is the sodium content from the left to the right side, from the low content to the high content, this is what is making the risk for left ventricular hypertrophy in this population. Second aspect, if you look on the toxicity of tissue sodium, and this is conducted in hemodialysis patient, looking on the peripheral insulin resistance, meaning that at the end, using your glycemic clamps, the study shows that there is an inverse relationship between insulin resistance and sodium content in the skin. So meaning that maybe insulin resistance is driven by some salt accumulation in the skin. And the last point, we know that there is a vicious circuit between fluid overload or sodium excess and inflammation. This is part of the game. And we know also that it's a part of this imbalance between the inflammation and the regulatory process. So meaning that we have a link between salt accumulation and inflammation. Is it possible to remove salt store in the skin? That's the only study I found. And this is based on the quantification of sodium based on closed circuit for hemodiasis, showing that at the end, you can calculate the mass of sodium removal per session and uh, plotting with the sodium 
calculated from the MRI, it fit perfectly, meaning that you can make an assessment from the sodium removed by the MRI imaging. And also, if you just look on the muscle and skin MRI, there is a reduction by 30 to 50% from pre to post, meaning that we can mobilize this sodium from the skin. This is a typical picture showing that at the end in the 75 years old patient, if you remove 2.7 liters, the skin sodium content was 32 millimoles down to 19 millimoles. So almost 50% reduction within a four hours digestion. So what is the take home message from this story? This is what I, I mentioned. Salt accumulation across chronic kidney disease progression is a tremendous both on both sectors, the extracellular and the tissue. And that we have to do is of course to monitor more adequately the patient to make sure that we understand what is your amount to remove and then to act by emo, by PD, by preserving the kidney function in order to improve the outcome of the patient. And that will be the task of my colleagues, Professor Simon Davis for the PD patient and Andrew Davenport for emo diasis patient. So I am very pleased to introduce Professor Simon Davis and he would talk about optimizing sodium removal in PD patient. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So thank you, Peter, for um, your kind introduction uh, and also Bernard for your excellent uh, talk on sodium. As Peter says, I'm going to talk about optimizing sodium removal in PD patients. Um, and the scope of my talk is that I will say a little bit about residual kidney function at the start. Then we'll discuss dialytic removal of sodium, in particular focusing on the issue of sodium sieving and that how that affects uh, glucose-driven uh, fluid salt removal. And then we'll finish off by trying to answer this question, is the dialysate sodium concentration in PD fluid optimal? Uh, and look at some of the, what the trials have been telling us about this. So first of all, residual kidney function, and we all know how important maintaining residual kidney function is for the survival benefit of our patients. And it seems quite likely that that uh, part, at least part of that survival advantage associated with maintained residual kidney function relates to the fact that it improves sodium removal. And we also know from previous studies that we can enhance that uh, by, for example, using loop diuretics. There's a long-standing study from uh, Leicester showing that indeed uh, staying on a high dose of fruzamide on PD is associated with maintained better urinary sodium losses uh, as shown here. And there is another, one, another study uh, which, which tends to support that although that's a non-randomized study from Canada. It's perhaps just worth reminding ourselves, however, that it's a two-edged sword, this. Um, and uh, one of the difficulties perhaps in, in PD patients, if you want to control their blood pressure entirely by uh, salt um, restriction, uh, is that actually that may in itself lead to loss of residual kidney function. And there's a, this is a, a study from Turkey done some years ago now, showing that uh, it's possible to actually reduce urine output if you have a very strict approach to salt uh, intake uh, and increased ultrafiltration. So let's move on to thinking about um, uh, the, peritone the peritoneal and uh, uh, urinary sodium losses and how this relates to survival in PD patients. And there's a fairly good body of evidence showing that uh, the the better your urinary plus dialysate sodium losses are, the, the better is the survival. And this is just a collection of different studies showing this. But I should again point out that these are observational cohort studies, they're not randomized trials. Um, and the difficulty here is understanding whether that high increased sodium removal is simply a reflection of a better dietary uh, intake generally, which of course increases sodium intake, um, and therefore these are healthier patients eating better on dialysis or whether it's a function directly of the sodium removal itself. So now let's focus a little bit on the peritoneal component of sodium removal. 
And this is just a reminder of the membrane physiology that determines this. So we have our uh, three pore system. And you may remember that there's in the peritoneal membrane, there are ultra small pores, which are called aquaporins. And they are responsible for a significant proportion of ultrafiltration, which is sodium free, so-called free water transport. So to remove sodium from the peritoneal membrane, uh, using the peritoneal membrane, you have to uh, remove uh, salt and water through the small pore pathways. And uh, uh, we should also remember that those same pathways can be equally responsible for sodium reabsorption. So uh, particularly in patients who are reabsorbing fluid on PD, they will um, uh, unfortunately uh, go into positive sodium balance very easily if you have uh, have have uh, uh, net fluid reabsorption across the peritoneal membrane. So how does this issue of sodium sieving, uh, what consequences does it have for sodium removal? Well, we must be clear that undoubtedly the ultrafiltration volume itself is still the single most important determinant of sodium removal across the peritoneal membrane. But because of sodium sieving, the amount of sodium that comes across is less than you would get uh, for uh, ultrafiltration, um, which is fully equilibrated with plasma sodium. And typically speaking, in a CAPD patient, that would mean that for every litre of ultrafiltration, you'll typically remove about 100 millimoles of sodium. And this is less for APD patients uh, in the short exchanges overnight, where you will have about 70 millimoles of sodium typically removed per litre. That discrepancy between salt and water uh, removal is greatest when you're using hypertonic glucose and also when the patient has a, a relatively low peritoneal solute transfer rate, transfer rate. Remember, those individuals have a maintenance of their osmotic gradient for the longest, so that actually they'll get the best ultrafiltration, but they, a large proportion of that, uh, over 50% of it will come through the aquaporin pathway. So therefore, if you want to optimize sodium removal across membranes um, uh, to get the best, then um, particularly in APD patients, then certainly for the long exchange, you're going to have to use icodextrin, which is not dependent upon the aquaporin pathway. And so you will tend to get a sodium removal, which is much closer to the plasma concentration, typically around 130 millimoles per liter of, of ultrafiltrate. Just a word briefly about membrane dysfunction. We now um, clearly identify two types of membranes which are associated with less good ultrafiltration, those which have a fast solute transfer rate and those which have a reduction in the osmotic conductance to glucose across the membrane, less efficient membranes for the same osmotic gradient. In the fast transfer patient, then Actually, sodium sieving itself is less of a problem because the diffusion of sodium across the membrane is faster. And this will allow us to get better ultrafiltration, um, particularly if you're using, again, icodextrin in high, in high solid transport patients. And you can see in this uh, meta-analysis here that the best um, uh, additional extra ultrafiltration is obtained in patients uh, who have high or high average uh, transport membranes. In contrast, in the reduction of, of osmotic gradient, the actual phenotype there is that they have reduced sodium sieving. So sodium sieving per se is not the problem, but the problem now is the total ultrafiltration capacity of the membrane is low. So therefore you'll get poor sodium removal from that perspective. And in that situation, you're most certainly going to have to switch the patient to home, to, to, to hemodialysis in order to improve their sodium balance. Just finally, I want to talk a little bit about the sodium concentration in dialysis. It asks the question, is the sodium concentration optimal? Typically, in, in, in typical dialysis solutions, the sodium concentration runs between 131 and 134 millimoles per litre, uh, which is not so different to plasma, so you get very little diffusion of sodium. But that can be changed by reducing the sodium concentration in the dialysate. Um, but you have to remember that that does associate with a reduction in the osmotic concentration of, of, of dialysis fluid. And so certainly if you're going to reduce the, os the sodium a lot, but then you're going to have to com compensate with this by increasing the glucose concentration of the dialysate. Uh, 
both of the strategies have been tried and just a just modest versus a, a large reduction in sodium. And I'm going to look at the couple of trials that have looked at this to see whether these translate into any clinical benefits, in particular blood pressure control. So the first study I'm going to talk about uh, takes the approach of a significant reduction in the dialysate sodium concentration which uh, is done during a single dwell during the 24 hour period and is compensated for by a, an increase, a modest increase in the glucose concentration. In previous studies, we demonstrated that this did indeed result in uh, more sodium removal. Uh, and this is the result of a clinical trial that we did and published um, uh, last year. Patients were randomized to these two different solutions over a six month period with efficacy being looked at at two months into the study. The overall outcome of the primary endpoint was not different in these, in these two patient populations, uh, although the way in which that uh, endpoint was reached was in fact slightly different. Uh, the first thing to say is that in our control group, actually 30% of the patients met the endpoint of a reduction in blood pressure, presumably due, due to being in a study in a, a sort of placebo effect. In the case of the low sodium group, there was a reduction in the uh, um, uh, 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 blood pressure, but also, and perhaps more importantly, a significant proportion of the patients had, well, had medication withdrawn due to reduction in blood pressure, which was part of the primary endpoint uh, and was obviously quite different in this patient group. If we look at the secondary endpoints, uh, different measures of blood pressure control during the course of this study, you can see that there were no significant differences in 24 hour blood pressure monitoring or office blood pressure monitoring. There was, however, a significant difference in self monitored blood pressure by the patients. You can see this shown more detail uh, in the longitudinal uh, 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 map of, or graph of, of, of blood pressure changes during the trial. And perhaps the relevance of that was that the patients were, in fact, blinded to the treatment. So um, uh, that may be potentially a more significant uh, uh, finding. We now look at the other main study, which is taking a different approach. Rather here, the reduction in dialysate sodium was more modest, just to one to five millimoles per litre. But in this study, uh, this was given throughout the 24 hour exchange. Uh, again, 100 patients were randomised. The primary endpoint of the study was actually KT over V. So it was not specifically designed to look at blood pressure as a primary outcome. And you can see the longitudinal changes in blood pressure shown at the bottom of that slide here for the whole patient group. A subsequent post hoc analysis of that study, however, did suggest that in the patients who had lower residual kidney function in the study, and this is an important thing to remember that when you're doing these studies, that actually if you have a lot of residual kidney function, it's really hard to demonstrate an effect of sodium uh, on sodium removal. Uh, if you look at this, you can see that there was a significant reduction in the blood pressure on post, post hoc analysis. So what do these two studies suggest? Well, I think it does suggest actually that maybe the plasma, sorry, that the dialysate sodium may not be optimal, particularly when you think about uh, the patients uh, treated with APD. There does, I think, actually seem to be quite a strong signal that reducing dialysate sodium could have an effect on blood pressure. But these are not definitive studies. And I think how to best apply these solutions in the clinic and also to adapt them to, to shorter uh, APD exchanges, I think, requires significant further research. I should point out that neither study had found any serious adverse events. There was a little bit more hyponatremia in the continuous low sodium uh, dialysate solution, and neither had a negative effect on residual kidney function. And finally, neither of these studies, and now there are no studies as well that I'm aware of looking at interventions in PD patients, looking at whole body sodium, uh, and in particular, uh, tissue sodium. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Davis, for this interesting uh, talk. Before we move on, I would like to remind you out there in the audience that you should ask questions and you should use the question window. So now it's an honor for me to introduce the uh, third and last speaker, Professor David uh, 
Davenport that will discuss uh, choosing a dialysate sodium. Please proceed, Andrew. Um, thank you very much for that very kind invitation, um, Peter. I'm going to talk today about choosing a dialysate sodium for hemodialysis patients. As uh, Professor Cano pointed out to you, we do have a problem. So here are three sodium MRIs from people living in North London, all middle-aged men. And here is our healthy patient, our healthy person. There's just a little rim of sodium here, just around in the skin, in this healthy patient. This is a patient with Gittleman syndrome, a sodium-losing nephropathy. And as you can see, there is no sodium. And over here, I'm afraid, is one of my hemodialysis patients. Not only can you see the sodium deposited in the skin, but you can also see this vast amount of sodium also in his muscle. So we do have a problem in terms of sodium loading of our dialysis patients. Now, historically, the sodium concentration in hemodialysis solutions was also very low, often below 130. And even later, 132 was an average sodium. Now, reports from this historic era suggested that if you used a low dialysate sodium, then systolic blood pressure was lower, weight gains between dialysis sessions were lower, but patients suffered more cramps and had more hypotensive episodes during dialysis. And similarly, if the dialysate sodium was higher, then blood pressure tended to be higher, to be systolic blood pressure, weight gains were greater, but fewer cramps and less intradiarrhea hypotension. Now with the advances in dialysis machine technology, we traditionally now rely predominantly on convection, i.e. ultrafiltration, in terms of sodium removal, and much less on diffusive loss of sodium. But if we look at studies which have looked at changing sodium concentrations in dialysate, here's one from Korea, changing the dialysate sodium from 140 to 135. As you can see, for the majority of patients studied, the systolic blood pressure fell, as did diastolic blood pressure. And when they looked at patient bioimpedance in terms of volume status, then extracellular water was lowered by reducing the dialysate sodium. And the amount of hydration or overhydration by a bioimpedance was reduced, and the weight gains between dialysis sessions was reduced. And similarly, looking at echocardiograms, this is a different study. Again, reducing the dialysate sodium from 140 to 137. Systolic blood pressure fell. Number of blood pressure tablets dropped during the six-month study. Weight gains also fell. Looking at natriuretic peptides, brain natriuretic peptide concentrations dropped. And then when looking at echocardiographic findings, looking particularly at diastolic function, in terms of estimating the mitral valve excursion, then there's a beneficial effect in terms of reducing diastolic dysfunction, if you imagine stiffness of the heart, by moving to a lower dialysate sodium. However, one has to look at the other side of the coin, and that is what happens to blood pressure during dialysis. So if we first of all take a look at these two black lines here. So this is a study from the US, and here, they've chosen a dialysate sodium either 5 millimoles above the pre-dialysis blood sodium or 5 millimoles below it. And so here, if they start off, and this is looking at using the lower dialysate sodium first, you can see that blood pressure drops during the dialysis session. When they then switch these patients to a higher dialysate sodium, you can see that blood pressure is better preserved during the dialysis session. And in the light grey bars, they've done the opposite. Here, they've started off patients on a high dialysate sodium, and you can see the blood pressure actually rises during dialysis. And when they switch these patients to the lower dialysate sodium, you can see blood pressure is not as well maintained during the dialysis session. And this is mirrored also by a study from the UK. In this study, they did no ultrafiltration for the first two hours, using a high dialysate sodium of 145 and a low one of 135. And you can see here that the serum sodium drops during dialysis using the lower dialysate sodium. As you'd expect, osmolality drops much lower and faster in the patients using the lower dialysate sodium. And again, there was a drop in the blood pressure towards, particularly towards the end of dialysis using the lower dialysate sodium. And they estimated for every difference of one millimole of sodium, there'd be about a 1.7 millimeter drop in or change in blood pressure. 
So I'd like to think that I have shown you comparative newer studies supporting the old statements that if we choose a high dialysate sodium, then blood pressure is better maintained. And if we choose a lower dialysate sodium, then patients are less likely to have um, uh, blood pressure is better controlled and weight gains are lower. However, a meta-analysis of 23 studies, over 75,000 patients, essentially said that there was no clear benefit of a higher or lower dialysate sodium on blood pressure control. And actually, there was just a sense, a trend in the observational studies that intradialic weight gains were lower with lower dialysate sodium. And certainly in the interventional studies, there was no effect. And again, in terms of intradialytic hypotension, there were no differences as to whether a higher or low sodium was chosen. So why should this be? Well, one of the differences is that if you carefully look at the meta-analysis and divide the studies into single center and multi-center, then in the single center studies, then a lower dialysate sodium was associated with a reduced systolic blood pressure, reduced weight gains between dialysis sessions, and more episodes of hypotension. But in the multi-center studies, there was no beneficial effect or adverse effect of whether a higher or lower dialysate sodium was chosen. So we need to think about what are the confounders. So over here is looking at, this is the fall in systolic blood pressure. So the higher up this axis, the greater the fall in blood pressure. And what we're looking at here is the dialysate to sodium gradient. So patients who start off dialysis with a low dialysate, low sodium and a higher dialysate sodium don't tend to drop the blood pressure. But blood pressure is falling in patients who start dialysis with a higher sodium and a negative dialysate to sodium gradient. Now, if we look at some of the confounders, this is now looking at bioimpedance and volume assessment. So what we find here is that the systolic blood pressure is most likely to fall in patients who are closer to their target weight or actually dehydrated. Whereas those patients who are volume expanded with an increased excel of water are less likely to drop their blood pressure. So volume status is a major confounder in terms of these studies looking at whether higher or lower dialysate sodium is chosen. And the other issue is if we look at trends in what happens to blood pressure, with, particularly with a lower dialysate sodium, you can see that as patients are older, there is a greater effect in terms of choosing a lower dialysate sodium. So blood pressure or a reduction in blood pressure is much more likely to occur in older patients if we choose a lower dialysate sodium than if we look at younger patients. And again, for each of these different ages, then you can see here that the effect is greater for women in the sort of these uh, circles compared to the closed circles, which are men. So there's again an effect of gender and age as well as volume status. And if we consider that and look at how we try and assess sodium intake, this is just looking at uh, food frequency questionnaires. You can see from here that generally, look, this is looking at two different food frequency questionnaires, that men or males tend to eat more sodium than women with both of these questionnaires. And again, younger patients tend to eat more salt compared to older patients. And that probably explains some of the effects we've observed in terms of gender and in terms of age and choice of dialysate sodium. Now, when it comes to the dialysis machine, it's quite simple, isn't it? I mean, after all, we just take some dialysis water, we add an acid solution and a bicarbonate solution, and away we go with our dialysate. But there are some confounders, and this comes from the UK quality control data. And in this data, the same sample has been sent to a number of different laboratories to measure serum sodium. And as you can see, some laboratories record higher levels of sodium compared to others. And so when looking at multi-center multi studies, it's very important to have a single laboratory actually measuring the sodium. Otherwise, different laboratories will report different results. And the other issue, of course, is the dialysis machine. So here we have three different dialysis machines, A, B, and C. And here we've said, right, what is the dialysate sodium? And we've measured sodium in different ways. We've measured it by the standard 
laboratory method of indirect, electro, uh, indirect potentiometry, ISE. We've measured it by flame photometry in green, and we've measured it by iron chromatography in brown. And you can see that here's the prescribed sodium. And yet, some machines deliver higher sodium than other machines. So there can be a difference in the dialysis machine and how it mixes dialysate. And so what do dialysis machines do? They measure conductivity. And so conductivity is an estimate of sodium. However, it measures all the ions present, both cations and anions. And then different manufacturers have different approaches. So some dialysis machines have no active feedback. So simply, there are alarms set if the conductivity is too high or too low. But if the conductivity is not that prescribed, the machine will continue to deliver that dialysate sodium. Other manufacturers have instituted positive feedback loops. So if the conductivity is too high, the machine tries to reduce it. And similarly, if it's too low, it tends to tries to increase it. But the other issue is that just as if you purchase a bag of normal saline, it should have a sodium concentration of 155 millimoles per litre. But manufacturers are allowed to have an error. And in Europe, the error is around about 3%. So if you think about the acid concentrate, if we wanted a dialysate sodium 138, or an acid 103, and a bicarbonate 35, then the acid could be between 100 and 106, the bicarbonate between 34 and 36, and therefore the final composition could be anything between 134 and 142 millimoles per litre. So there are all these confounders which occur when we're trying to choose a dialysate sodium. So, one of the problems we have is that if we measure serum sodium and we measure the dialysate sodium, we're only going to get those results back after we've actually dialysed the patient. We're not getting real time information about what is actually going on with the patient. And some centers just simply use the same dialysate sodium for everybody by having a central control system. But what I've tried to point out to you is that patients differ in terms of their response in terms of volume status, in terms of age, in terms of gender, et cetera. So we do need to individualize the dialysate sodium for patients. Now, ideally, what we should do is have a system that automatically tells us what the dialysate sodium is and also what the patient's sodium is. And we can adjust the two together for that individual patient to achieve the appropriate sodium balance. If we don't have that, what can we do? Well, we should certainly service our dialysis machines and check the conductivity. In a healthy patient, we'd have to assume they're going to eat more sodium than we would like. And therefore, we need to think of a zero or negative gradient in terms of between the dialysate sodium and the serum sodium. And we should also, when we're measuring serum sodium, remember to adjust it for the glucose effect, as more and more patients now have diabetes. And then in the elderly and comorbid patient who may not be eating very much, we need, they need to use a high dialysate sodium or a zero or positive dialysate to sodium gradient. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Davenport, for this excellent uh, presentation. And uh, now to you all out in the audience, you have an excellent opportunity to ask questions about sodium to Dr. Canoa, Dr. Davis and Dr. Davenport. So I hope we have some uh, hard questions for you. <laughs> Let's see if they are coming here. We have, this is a question for you, Bernard. The non-osmotic sodium storage seems to have an important role. Would you advocate mobilization and removal of these store, stores by dialysis? Yeah, sure. We have to do, and certainly we need to be a little bit more careful about this sodium mass balance that we can achieve. And as Andrew Davenport mentioned, when we make a sodium mass balance, this is just based on what we are able to collect. We don't know what we are sucking from the tissue. This is why certainly we need to have this sodium MRI technology or techniques to make sure that we can achieve what we are looking. The sodium from the osmotic as aspect is easy. It's quite easy to make an assessment because you get the pressure, you get the volumia, you get so many markers, but from the sodium tissue, that's a little bit more complex. And then this is why some limitations are coming and MRI, sodium MRI, uh, 
should be maybe the next step. New technology is coming, maybe with a sort of wearable MRI technology, but still not yet. So the tool is still part of the scientific research or clinical research, but certainly the sodium store in the tissue has a lot of activity, as I mentioned, inflammatory, insulin resistance, vascular stiffness, uh, pro uh, protein energy wasting. So we know that salt, salt store in the tissue and particularly in the skin, as Andrew Davenport showed in the pictures, that's part of the comorbid condition of the patient that we have to take care. But how to make the monitoring, that's a different story. Thank you. Can I have the next question, please? And this is for you, Andrew. In many centers, there seems to be a discrepancy about theory, individualization of sodium prescription and practice. One sodium prescribed for all. Could you comment on that? Well, I think, um, as I pointed out, Peter, that there are some inherent problems with that. Um, as Bernard mentioned, we are limited at the moment in terms of the number of patients that any unit has actually performed sodium MRIs. But obviously, there are some patients who are just not eating very well, and they're likely to have low sodium tissue stores. And if we try and take away too much sodium in those patients, we're likely to then develop hypotension and cause them to have cramps, et cetera, on dialysis. Whereas other patients are obviously eating a large amount of sodium. As Professor Davis said, we don't know yet as to whether the patients in whom we're, we can measure large amounts of sodium being removed just reflects the fact that they're eating better, more physically active, et cetera. So that's, that's the conundrum we have. And you know, at the end of the day, we're all different. So I would say that one size does not fit all. Um, and if you do give all the patients the same sodium concentration, then you will be giving some patients too much sodium. And at the end of dialysis, they'll feel thirstier and go and eat and drink more. And you'll get into a vicious circle. So I think it does need to be tailored to the individual. Yes, I think your data show that the age and the sex seems to be important factors to uh, when you uh, look at uh, sodium homeostasis. Can I have the next question, please? Okay, so this is a question that any one of you could answer. Are there any data on the influence of sodium removal on post hemodialysis fatigue? That could be feel, for, uh, yeah, for Andrew, that could be part of the answer, but I can provide uh, after that some comment. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the issue with post dialysis fatigue is, is that there are two components to it. So there's what I call early fatigue and then late fatigue. Um, late fatigue often tends to go with patients feeling depressed and having other psychological issues. Um, early fatigue certainly is related to the dialysis um, technique itself. And I think the difference there is that I are, I'm unaware of any study which has actively measured sodium removal and then looked at post dialysis fatigue. There are studies published which looked at um, bioimpedance measurements of external water, um, and they essentially show that there's more fatigue in patients who um, leave the dialysis unit volume overloaded. Um, and that's as far as I'm aware. Bernard, do you have any uh, better data? No, no, I completely agree with you. It's uh, the fatigue symptom which is coming at the end of the dialysis is a multiple factors. It's not just reflecting sodium removal, but also osmotic change, electrolyte uh, changes. So it's so many factors. But what is clear from the different study, more you get fast in the dialysis efficacy and more you get fatigue. That's the point. It's, uh, if you put short dialysis, very efficient compared to long, slow, poorly or uh, slow efficient, then the fatigue score couldn't be completely different. So that's the point. Because again, in a fatigue also, you can remove a lot of amino acid and maybe certainly you have some change in the cells between, I would say, protein, uh, catabolism, amino acid removal. So it's not just linked to the sodium or the volume. It's a little bit more complex than that. If I may just, okay. just add, add to that. Yes. Uh, because uh, I think I, mean, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I would have 
I mean, I don't know so much about hemodialysis patients, but certainly in PD patients, um, you know, the fatigue is often linked to sarcopenia and muscle weakness. Um, people who are muscle wasted also are more likely to be overhydrated. Um, there's a there's a there's a coupling that goes on in bioimpedance when you measure that, which actually means that that that, that you know that the two go together to some extent. Uh, so we mustn't be we must be careful in in saying it's all to do with overhydration and salt and water. It may also be simply just due to loss of muscle mass. Sure. Thank you all. And uh, can I have the next question, please? This is also a question open for any one of you. In APD, regarding sodium removal, would you expect a difference in sodium removal caused by the total number of cycles when the total treatment time does not change? That is for 5 versus 8 during 8.30 uh, 8 hours. Maybe this is something for you, Dr. Davis. Yes, I mean, you, you would. Um, there was a very nice study done by Andres Vichitil some time ago now when he, um, he uh, demonstrated that if you increase the number of exchanges uh, on an APD cycle, uh, so you have lots of short exchanges, the idea is to get massive increases in urea clearance. And what he found when he did that was actually got a reduction in sodium removal. Um, so you can definitely get that wrong. Um, and if you do a lot of very short exchanges on APD, then you will, even though the overall treatment time may be the same, you will get less sodium removal. There's a little bit of data, um, not all published, I'm embarrassed to say, um, saying that actually if you if you go for a tidal cycle, for example, um, uh, that allows you to do more exchanges, but of course leave 50% or more of the dialysis extra behind, then you do get less of that gap between water and salt removal. Uh, but it's something you have to be careful of um, uh, in, in, in the APD prescription. Do Bernard and uh, Andrew have anything to add or? Not, I agree, I agree. I'm not an no. expert on this APD, but certainly this is true. Uh, so can I have the next question, please? Uh, what do you think about rationale of e isonatric dialysis? This is for Andrew. Who would volunteer? <laughs> Andrew. So there's been quite a, an, an interest in isonatric dialysis. And the idea here is essentially trying to match the dialysate sodium to the serum. Um, however, the issue here is how best to do it. Um, because I said for most of us, um, we're only able to do this in, if imagine, after the event. Um, and I think that there are some reports suggesting um, improved cardiovascular stability with isonatric dialysate and also reducing weight gains. Now, again, these are um, short term results. Um, they're not usually in multi center studies as yet. Um, and people are <coughs> in machine technology to try and deliver isentremic dialysis. Um, so the idea, I say, is to match the, the, the two. Um, and so to my way of thinking, it is where the Darsis machine manufacturers will be going, I think, over the next five or six years. And this will probably become um, a standard um, in machines in, I don't know, 2000 and uh, where are we now, 20, so 2025, et cetera. That's uh, true, but uh, just to, to, to add some comment on the Andrew, I would say, notes, it's already on the machine because that's a technology which is embarked on a new, I would say, Fresenius machine. I don't want to make any uh, advertisement. This is part of the automated sodium control. So that means at the end, the machine is sensing plasma sodium concentration of the patient. And depending on a prescri prescription from the physician, could adjust dies it sodium to the plasma. So or you keep isonatremic or maybe you increase or you reduce depending what you want to do. And the machine take care about the sodium mass balance. So on the same automated sodium control module, then you get way of monitoring sodium mass balance of the patient and water free balance of the sodium, but also you can act 
on the plasma conductivity of the patient to keep isonatremic or to increase or reduce. This is part of this new technology already validated on the technical aspects. But as you mentioned, we miss all this outcome-based study. Uh, so we have a lot of good questions here at, for you today. Do we have a next question? And this is addressed to uh, Professor Davenport. Do you suggest that bioimpedance bio should be regularly used for the assessment of fluid status? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think, as Professor Davis has mentioned, there are some confounders one has to think about in terms of bioimpedance. So the way that bioimpedance works is that um, we can get different estimations of volume status in patients, particularly with those with extremes of body mass index, so people with a very low BMI and people with very high BMI, and also particularly in patients where there's been some degree of malnutrition, muscle wasting, etc. cetera. Um, and in those patients, what bioimpedance can tell you is that there's, there is fluid. But what bioimpedance can't tell you is whether you can readily remove that fluid or that additional fluid, et cetera, during a hemodialysis session. And I think that when you have patients with, uh, who are inflamed, who have um, sarcopenia, sometimes the fluid is not readily mobile, mobilizable. So the bioimpedance machine will tell you, yes, this person's got extra fluid on board. But when you come and try and remove that fluid, you find that the patients become hypotensive. So I think it is helpful, and I think serial measurements are helpful to give you advice as to where the target weight should be set for an individual patient. Um, but I would not um, suggest that a one-off reading on a, from a bioimpedance machine will tell you everything that you want to know. They have to be repeated over time, I'm afraid. So Dr. Kanoa and Davis, do you have anything to yeah. add? That's a good point, and I agree completely with Andrew. We know that a fluid overload, we can make an assessment by the bioimpedance. Again, with multi-frequency, this is a little bit more sensitive as compared to the monofrequency. But the next tool is to use relative blood volume change, and that's a way to make an assessment about capacity of refilling rate, meaning that we can show or at, at least try to probe the patient to mobilize this uh, Fluid excess could be in the interstitial or somewhere. So we have two tools. One is a by impedance and maybe playing with a relative blood volume change on the volume, volume monitoring on diagnosis. This is a complementary tool to make an assessment and to probe the patient to see where we can go to drive safely the patient. So perhaps okay. I just... Simon, yeah. You know, I just something about PD, seeing as we're, we're discussing by impedance. Um, uh, I mean, I think I, I definitely completely agree with Andrew that that um, uh, how you use it is not easy, um, and longitudinal measurements probably tell you more uh, than a single uh, measurement. There's an additional confounding factor in PD, which needs to be borne in mind, which is hyperalbuminemia, which is common in in, in patients uh, due to the uh, loss of proteins from the PD fluid. So that again may mean that these patients are fluid overloaded, but it's very difficult to shift that extra fluid if a patient is hypoalbuminemic. So there, there, it's a complicated issue, but there is a bit of bit of a um, data coming through. I think from a number of PD studies now suggesting that it might certainly have be some value in aneurysm patients. Um, uh, so, so I think it's still a matter of watch this space to see how how things progress. Thank you. Uh, so I can have the next question, please. So is it possible that by mobilizing large amounts of sodium, we maintain high levels of angiotensin and this is counterproductive for patients? Interesting question. Who feel uh, confident to all answer this? Andrew, maybe you can start. Well, one of the problems with a lot of dialysis patients is that some of the normal autoregulation systems don't particularly work as well as they would do in a normal individual. And so I think that you have to turn around and say that we know, let's say for sake of argument, that vasopressin response in dialysis patients is markedly blunted. 
and again, we think that uh, the roles of angiotensin are also blunted in dialysis patients. If anything, we now think that actually sympathetic tone is an important in terms of regulating blood pressure in dialysis patients. So I, I would rephrase that and say that if we remove a large amount of sodium from patients, then we may cause a lower blood pressure. And that's because if we start to remove sodium, and although we talked about sodium being in the skin, we know from studies performed in the 1950s in patients who had hypertension and were undergoing um, gluteal artery biopsies, that the media of these small arteries contains more sodium in patients with hypertension. So there is a tonicity issue. So if you remove too much sodium, then we're going to reduce tone and we could see blood pressure drop. If you said to me, which of the systems do I think would be most activated in the dialysis patient, it would be sympathetic nervous system activity rather than um, angiotensin, uh, rather than say vasopressin, et cetera, is what I would think. Do you agree, Bernard? Yeah, no, I agree completely the point. Uh, and just to complement what uh, Andrew said, again, it's not just the point of the volemia. The point is uh, the volemia over the time. Because if you set the same volume removal, but longer time, you don't get this type of uh, angiotensin activation. And also the point is, of course, if we know that thirst is mediate, mediated by the angiotensin too, it's a nice way to understand if you get the patient thirsty at the end of the dialysis session, there is a link with this type of activation of the RAS system. So again, it's not only just a way of removing the salt volume or the, salt, the volume, but also the time of the, remove, the removing this volume is very important in this equation. Uh, okay, can I have the next question, please? And this is for you, Dr. Davis. There is significant difference in sodium removal between CAPD and APD. Would you expect differences in sodium storage? I suppose the answer to that is you might, but I don't, I'm not aware of any clear data on that. Um, uh, we should also remember that that, that may be that the um, total sodium removal might still be more in APD patients because they may have more odd filtration and less fluid reabsorption. So it doesn't necessarily equate. Um, and if they're using icodextrin in the daytime, then actually their, their sodium removal may be better on APD. So it's a complicated picture. We'd need to compare like with like. Um, but I'm not aware, that maybe Andrew knows that, but I'm not aware of any studies that have compared APD and CAPD and looked at sodium storage. Do, do you know of any, Andy? So, um, Simon, I would agree. I'm unaware of any studies that have systematically looked at either skin sodium or whole body or limb sodium in different uh, groups of peritoneal dialysis patients. Um, and as you pointed out, Simon, if you go to the literature, you'll find some publications reporting no differences in sodium removal between cyclic systems and CAPD. Um, and so you know, it's not as clear cut as people might uh, think. People and uh, with forget. this, I yeah. Carry on. You want to add something? Well, I was just going to say people tend to forget that that in in CAPD systems that they are not thinking about the the, the overfill problem. So actually, sometimes they forget that that the dialysate fluid is is that you get the odd filtration you get is less than you're ready ready getting. Uh, so in, in fact, it may be the other way around. Okay, I believe this was the last question for you. So I would like to thank you all, Dr. Kano, Davis and Davenport for these erudite um, lectures and the deep dive into sodium of dialysis. And uh, I would like to thank you all out in the audience for your participation. I would like to remind you that the next webinar, number 15, is June number one, June 1st and it's Professor Ronald Gansewort that will talk about something very timely. It's about COVID-19 vaccines, drugs, ongoing trials. How far have we come? So don't miss this event. And finally, 
in September 15 to 18, we will arrange the live 2021 Nephrology Congress. And I would like us to ask all of you to save the date for there will be a number of very interesting presentations uh, during this meeting. Thank you for participating.